Good evening. Welcome to another session of the Comfort Verses in Context. Now, last week, we started our, our Holy Week series entitled, A Call Back to the Cross of Christ. So far, we are moving through the Holy Week season and we have been we have seen Paul's prayer to the Lord who is able to establish the believer according to his gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. By this, we have seen the scriptures that there are two unique and distinct perspectives about the preaching of Jesus Christ, which is, number one, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to prophecy and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Now, last week, we have seen that the revelation of the mystery is given by the Lord Jesus to the Apostle Paul for us Gentiles in this dispensation of grace. And we can read that in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 up to verse 7. Now, this mystery was kept secret since the world began, but is now made manifest and known by the Spirit through the Apostle Paul, who is the spokesperson for this dispensation of grace and the Apostle of the Gentiles. Now, last Thursday, as part of our Holy Week series, we looked also at the importance of Paul's gospel, which we talked about last week in our comfort verses, which is the declaration of who Jesus is being the Christ of the seed of David and what he has done that is his death for our sins, burial, and resurrection. Now, in regard to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we want to look at and see the difference of how the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is preached according to prophecy and according to the revelation of the mystery. Now, before we start our study this evening, let us first come to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that indeed the scripture tells us that there are two unique and distinct perspectives about the preaching of Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. Tonight, Father, I pray that your spirit of wisdom and revelation would illumine the eyes of our understanding. Help us to receive your word with all readiness of mind. And let us search also the scriptures, whether the things we learn tonight are indeed so. And pray, Father God, that you will be with us and the truths that we are about to receive, let it simply burn in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Now, the title of our study this evening is this, The Two Perspectives of the Death, Burial, and Resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, we start with this question. Were were there prophecies of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Christ? Now, here is the plain scriptural truth as it is written in Luke chapter 24, verse number 44, where Luke records the Lord telling the disciples in the road to Emmaus, saying, And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Now, we would see that there were things that were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as a matter of fact, these are the clear prophecies of Christ's death burial and resurrection first from the law as we would read in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 where God tells uh, where God declares saying and I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel then from the law 
we would read also from the prophets in Isaiah 53 verse 4 to 5 where Isaiah prophesied the word of the Lord that says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. That's very clear. That's a reference to the death of Christ, his suffering, his burial, and his resurrection, as well as from the Psalms, where Psalm 16 verse 10, the psalmist says, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. This is indeed the truth that the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is actually prophesied in the scriptures. No wonder we would read these words that Christ said. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Therefore, we can come to this simple conclusion that the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ was indeed prophesied. So, if the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is according to prophecy, then what's the difference and why is there a need to emphasize the preaching of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery? Now, actually, because of this, we have to ask the question, what is the purpose of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ according to prophecy. Now, let us see what Scripture says in Matthew chapter 12, verse 38 to 41. And first, it is very important to pay attention to who is speaking and who is being talked to. Now, we start our reading in Matthew chapter 12, verse number 38, where we read these words recorded by Matthew. He said, then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. Now from here, you would see the, the, the characters in the narrative, which are, uh, which are the certain of the scribes and the Pharisees, as well as the Lord Jesus Christ, whom they are calling Master. And... What is being asked of the Lord Jesus in this pericope is that the certain of the scribes and Pharisees would see a sign from him. Now, remember, it is indeed a Jewish thing to ask for a sign. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22 said that the Jews require a sign. Now, the religious leaders were representing the people of Israel as a nation that asked Jesus for a sign. And Christ answers them in verse 39, where we read, But he answered and said unto them. Now, the he in that passage is none other than Jesus Christ, whom they called Master in verse 38. But he answered and said unto them, the them being the certain of the scribes and the Pharisees, and the representation of the people of Israel is seen in the parallel passage in Luke chapter 11 verse 29, where God, where Christ calls them an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. Now, we would see that there shall no sign be given. And these are the people of Israel. This evil and adulterous generation would be the people of Israel 
recorded in Luke chapter 11, verse 29. And Christ tells them, And there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of Jonah. Now, what is the sign of Jonah? It's expounded in the next verse, in verse number 40, where Christ says, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, here's an important truth that we have to see. Now, the sign of Jonah is the perfect picture that Christ who died, spent three days and three nights buried, and then rose again the third day. So when Christ talks about the sign of Jonah, of the Son of Man spending three days and three nights in the belly of the earth, it's talking about Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Now a good question to ask is this. Is this interpretation further warranted by the scriptures? Now consider the sign of Jonah is stated again in Matthew chapter 16, verse 4, where Christ repeats the statement saying, A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. Now why is this significant? Because it is also in Matthew chapter 16, especially in verses 15 to 21, where we would read a direct revelation of Jesus Christ and what will happen to him. Now we started reading in verse number 15, where we read the record of Matthew that says, And he said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. The, and the question is quite simple. Who do ye say that I am? That Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And we would read Christ's response to that in the next verse where we read, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now here's an important truth. Christ clearly affirmed the declaration of the Apostle Peter that Jesus indeed is the Christ. And Christ says, This is not revealed to Peter by flesh or blood, but rather this is revealed by the Spirit of God or by God the Father Himself. Now, Jesus is indeed the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now in verse 20, we would see Christ's further instructions where he says, Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. So Jesus affirmed that he is indeed the Christ. And at that time, the disciples ought not to tell any man that he is the Christ. Now here is the pivotal truth. In verse 21, we read these words. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Now, if we would make the connection from the sign of Jonah that was just given to Israel who sought the sign, then we would see that the Lord Jesus is indeed saying that He is the Christ, the Son of Man, who will be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights and then rise again. Therefore, we see this truth in the Scriptures. The sign of Jonah is Jesus Christ's death, burial, 
and resurrection. Now let us see also that the sign of Jonah is given to Israel by the Lord Jesus Christ who is the minister of the circumcision. Now we can actually read that in Romans chapter 15 verse 8 where Paul says, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. So, let's complete our deduction that the sign of Jonah is Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection given to Israel by the Lord Jesus Christ who is the minister of the circumcision. Now, what exactly is this sign for? Now, we can read that in verse 41 of Matthew chapter 12 where we read Christ's words that says, The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. Now, we see that the men of Nineveh will condemn this generation, which Christ referred to previously as the evil and adulterous generation. Why? Because the men of Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. The men of Nineveh will rise with the evil and adulterous generation and condemn them because they repented at Jonah's preaching while someone greater than Jonah is there. But this evil and adulterous generation did not repent. By this, we see a truth, which is the sign of Jonah, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of the Christ, was intended to put blame on Israel, calling them to repentance. Now, seeing it this way, we would realize Peter's preaching at Pentecost did present the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ to Israel, but do pay attention that he levels blame for Israel and to Israel for murdering their Messiah. That's why we would read these words starting from Acts chapter 2, verse number 22, where we read, Peter declares, saying, And ye men of Israel, now that makes it very clear who Peter was talking to. And he said, Hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves know. Now here's the blame that Peter levels against Israel. He said, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. So, we would see that Israel was laid blame by the Apostle Peter because they have taken and by wicked hands crucified and slain their Messiah. And that shows the death and the burial of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this Christ who died, God raised up according to the words of Peter. Now, the thrust of the presentation of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is as we continue to see in verse 32 to 36 where Peter says, This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we, are all, we all are witnesses, therefore being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he had shed forth this which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he said himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until my, I make thy foes thy footstool. 
Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made that same Jesus whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. That is Peter declaring to Israel the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, laying blame on Israel, calling Israel to repent. That is why in Acts chapter 2, verse 37 to 38, we read these words. And when they have uh, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now pay attention that the third person personal pronouns, they, them, and their, are re in reference to all the house of Israel in verse 36. Now, all of these house of Israel did ask Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And what did, what did Peter say? Next verse. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. By this we see the truth, that the preaching of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ according to prophecy was meant to lay blame on Israel, calling them to repentance. Now by this, we begin to see the uniqueness and distinction of the preaching of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Now, do remember that the revelation of the mystery is laid out clearly in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 to 3, where we read these words. For this cause, I, Paul, now we can see a spokesperson here, the Apostle Paul, who is the Apostle of the Gentiles, that's in Romans chapter 11, verse 3, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7, and 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number, uh, chapter 2, verse number 11. Now, hence this Paul, a prisoner of the Gentiles, for you Gentiles. Now, this shows us an audience that this is for us Gentiles. And we would read that, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, Lord. Now, what is this dispensation of grace? Paul expounds, saying, How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Now, we could see here that this is the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Now, this mystery is described and revealed further in Ephesians 3, 5 to 7, where Paul says, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets. So, what was revealed to the apostle Paul in times past was unknown but when it was revealed to Paul then it was made known uh, it was made known unto the Lord's holy apostles and prophets by the spirit and what is this mystery all about we read in verse 6 where Paul says that the gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ. So basically, this mystery that Paul is bearing, that God revealed to the Apostle Paul, is about the Gentiles' benefit. Now, how is this benefit of the Gentiles going to be brought about? Verse 7, we read, 
that these Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of the prom of his promise in Christ, it's by the gospel whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Now this gospel whereof I was made a minister points to none other but Paul's gospel which we can read clearly and succinctly in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 to 4, where Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also ye have received and were in ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. What's the content? How that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Thus, we would see this truth, that Paul's gospel is the preaching of Christ's death for our sins, burial and resurrection for the benefit of both Jews and Gentiles in this dispensation of grace. Now because of this, it's important to pay attention to the phrase for our sins because this tells us that Paul's gospel is the preaching of Jesus Christ's death for our sins his burial, and his resurrection. This is why the content of Paul's gospel in the gospel of our salvation also says, for our sins, and the hour there would pertain to both Jews and Gentiles in this dispensation of grace. This shows us that the emphasis of Paul in the death of burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ is what benefit we in this dispensation of grace get. Now this time, the Gentiles who were previously aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise are now included in God's dealing by the gospel whereof Paul was made a minister. And because of this gospel, we Gentiles are made fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of His promise in Christ. Now, for this reason, we read the preaching of the Apostle Paul of his gospel in his first missionary journey in Antioch, Pisidia, would include these words and this benefit statement in verse 26 in Acts chapter 13, verse number 26, where Paul says, Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, that, that's a Jewish audience, and whosoever among you feareth God. Now this phrase, whosoever among you feareth God, would later on be revealed in verse 42 as in reference to the Gentiles who when the Jews were offended with Paul's preaching, left and the Gentiles besought Paul that these words be preached again to them next Sabbath day. And we would see the statement of this benefit where Paul declares, To you is the word of this salvation sent. Now, we would see, moving on in that passage in verse 27, For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets which are read every Sabbath day. Now notice how Paul used the third person. He did not tell his audience, you knew him not, nor you did not know the voices of the prophets. No, he said, they knew him not. And they who knew him not, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause of death in him, yet they sired day Pilate that he should be slain. 
And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. Now that's the death, the burial, and we would read the resurrection in the next verse. But God raised him from the dead. So Paul declared the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ to both a Jew and Gentile audience. But here's the clincher. In verses 38 to 39, Paul gives this offer. He says, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, in reference to Jesus Christ, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified, uh, are justified from all things, from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Now we see the benefit for both Jews and Gentiles of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And the benefit is the forgiveness of sins and justification from all things to all that believe. Therefore, we would see this simple truth that the preaching of G of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection according to the revelation of the mystery is meant to present the benefits of forgiveness of sins and justification from all things for both Jews and Gentiles calling them to believe. No wonder we hear the declaration of the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 1.30 in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that holy spirit of promise. We hear the gospel of Christ, death for our sins, burial, and resurrection. We trust in Christ, believing the sufficiency of his finished work. Sufficient to save us for giving all trespasses and being justified from all things to them that believe. Now such is the preaching of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection according to the revelation of the mystery. And it's preached by the Apostle Paul to both Jews and Gentiles in this dispensation of grace. Therefore, we would see two perspectives of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. One is according to prophecy for Israel in their dispensation, and another according to the revelation of the mystery for both Jews and Gentiles in this dispensation of grace. The difference is simply that the preaching of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ according to prophecy was meant to lay blame on Israel, calling them to repentance. While the preaching of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, according to the revelation of the mystery, is meant to present the benefits of forgiveness of sins and justification from all things for both Jews and Gentiles, calling them to believe. Therefore, this Holy Week season, let us preach Paul's gospel that declares Christ's death, burial, and resurrection for the forgiveness of sins and justification from all things, calling men to trust in Christ, believing the sufficiency of His finished work. Now let me pray for you. Father, we thank you for the truth that we have heard. And we pray, Father God, that we would indeed emphasize the forgiveness and justification that is brought about, availed freely by your Son's death for our sins, burial, and resurrection. Father, help us to see the distinction and preach the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery and help us to indeed declare the gospel that saves in this dispensation of grace today. Father, 
May the truths that we have received from your word this evening, let it simply burn in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So thank you very much for listening. We hope to catch you again in our future broadcasts on Monday. We continue our studies of the sacred Psalms for the saints. And on Thursday, we resume our study of the Paulin Pastorate online Bible study on the book of 1 Timothy. And we're going to look at understanding the biblical term bishop. And next week, hope that you can join us again for another session of the comfort verses in context. So thank you very much for listening. The Lord bless you. <music>